All right, let's take our Bibles and go to Psalm 9 this morning. Psalm number 9 and Psalm number 10 is where we're going to be. If you... We've been going through some of the Psalms on uh, Sunday morning. And many of the Psalms, as you know, were written by David, King David. And the Bible describes David as a man after God's own heart. David really loved the Lord. Now, David had some failures and some shortcomings, and he, did some, he, he uh, battled sin like the rest of us. But he loved the Lord so much, and yet many times David found himself surrounded by some very dark and some very difficult circumstances, such is the case in these psalms. Look at Psalm 9, verse 13. Psalm 9, 13. Have mercy upon me, says, O Lord. Consider my what? Trouble, which I suffer of them that hate me. Thou that liftest me up from the gates of death. Go over to Psalm 10, verse 1. He says, Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? And you know, many of the Psalms give us some insight into what was going through the heart and through the mind of David as he went through some troublesome times in his life. You know, it's many of the Psalms, what it's like we get a glimpse into the heart of David. It's like we get a glimpse in, into his inner being. We get a glimpse into the inner thinking processes of David as he goes through a lot of the trials and the problems that he went through in life. And it's kind of neat. You know, um, some of you, maybe you keep a diary, or today I think they call it a journal, you know, and you journal. And what are you doing? You're writing down your, your thoughts. You're writing down your, your feelings. You're writing down those, those innermost uh, uh, thoughts that are going on in your mind and you're, and you're writing them down. That's what we have here, of course. It's by inspiration of God. But God allowed David and led David to write down what was in his heart, what was in his mind when he went through just terrible things in his life. You know, the question is this. How do we live victoriously when it seems like believers suffer and yet the wicked seem to prosper? Well, David's going to teach us in these two Psalms, Psalm 9 and 10. But I want you to notice how he begins in Psalm 9, verses 1 and 2. Look at it with me. He said, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. David begins these psalms by just praising the Lord. He's singing praise to God even in the midst of some very dark and some very difficult circumstances. And it's because, here's why. You say, how can you, how can you sing praise to the Lord when you're going through trouble and suffering and problems? And here, here's how he could do it. It's because he was contemplating the spiritual truths that we're going to read about in the next two Psalms. And these truths, as, as we get a glimpse into the heart of David, and we get a glimpse into his thinking processes, we, we see what's going on up there in that brain of his. Do you ever look at somebody and say... Boy, I'd love to know what's on their mind right now. You ever, you ever look at your wife, guys, and wonder what's going on in that mind up there of hers? And, uh, and, and you think, man, you may ask him, well, what, what's on your mind? You know, well, David tells us what's on his mind here in Psalm 9 and 10. And he's going to reveal to us what's on his mind, what's on his heart. And, and he's suffering, he's in some dark circumstances, but yet... He sings praises to the Lord. How can he do that? He's contemplating some truth. And and these truths will not only encourage David, they'll encourage you. And they'll cause you to praise God even when the outlook may be dark. Now, let me tell you something this morning, church. Dr. Phil and Oprah is not where it's at for the believer, okay? If you're looking for help in the midst of trouble... That's not where it's at, okay? And, and you're not going to find help in the, in the self-help section of Barnes & Noble or Amazon.com. Let me tell you something. You say, well, where as a believer am I going to find help? Where am I going to find victory? You're going to find victory by filling your mind with God's truth like David did. The key to victory, the key to help for you is in God's Word. It's God's truth. And as you contemplate these truths and as you think on them, as you dwell on them, then it encourages your heart. And you can do like David and you can praise the Lord with your whole heart. You can can be glad and rejoice in Him. 
Do you understand that when he wrote verses 1 and 2, that he's in the midst of trouble? He's in some very dark, difficult circumstances. But yet he says, I'm going to be glad. I'm rejoicing in you. I sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. How can we do that? Well, there's some truths here that we see that David was thinking about. What are they? Let me give them to you. Number one, the first truth is this in your handout. God will always do right. That's the first truth that you need to meditate on and think about. God will always do right. Now go over to Psalm 11 real quick. And I know that's not our text, but I just real quickly want you to turn a page. Go over to Psalm 11. And I'm actually going to take a whole um, Sunday morning on this psalm. But I just want to read verse 7. It says, For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. Now, what does that tell me about my God? For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. Righteousness just means doing right. So what does that tell me about my God? If the righteous Lord, that lets me know in your handout it says, God's very nature is one of righteousness. God's very nature. You know, I like in 1 John 2, 1, when Jesus is called the righteous. I love that. I love that name. John calls Jesus the righteous. He just calls him the righteous. You know, I, I just love that. And you know, I, I'm thinking about Revelation 19, 11, when the Bible says that when Jesus returns to the earth, the Bible says that in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Even when he comes and makes war with the ungodly, the Bible says he does it in righteousness. He does it doing what is right. And no matter what David was going through, I want you to look at verse Psalm 9. Go back to Psalm 9, verse 4. No matter what David was going through, he reminded himself of what you read in verse 4. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou saddest in the throne. What's the last two words? Boy, you ought to underline those two words. Judging right. He said, you know what? No matter what I'm going through, and this is in your handout, he reminded himself that God was sitting on his throne Judging right. You know, on this sinful earth that we live on, I have found as a pastor two interesting things that can occur. We live on a sin-cursed earth. There's, there's trouble that comes. And here's what I have found as a pastor now, and I've been here for, for 20 years now. And here's what I've found. Believers, Christians who know the Lord, who are encountering trouble in their life, They can mistakenly think God's forgotten them. You know, they're they're thinking that, uh, you know, God doesn't see what I'm going through. God must not know. He must not care. God just has, does not care about me. And then on the other hand, you got the wicked, the ungodly. And many times they're out there prospering in their sin. They're seemingly prospering. And they can likewise think that God's forgotten about their sin. God's forgotten about their wickedness. God doesn't see. God doesn't hear. God isn't noticing what they're doing. And and so you got believers who think God doesn't care. And then many times you've got the wicked who give no thought to God. And they feel like that, you know, God doesn't care of the, the sin that I'm doing. And David in these Psalms reminds himself neither one of those things is true. You see, David reminds himself here, and he's meditating on truth, and he reminds himself, you know what? God sees every act of wickedness, and God's not forgotten about it. Go over to Psalm 10 and verse 11. Psalm 10, verse 11. Notice what the ungodly, the wicked say. Verse 11, he has said in his heart, the ungodly, God hath forgotten. He hideth his face. He will never see it. Look at verse 14. I love it. What does it say? (laughs) David says, the wicked say, well, God hadn't seen it. A couple verses later, he says, thou hast seen it. (laughs) You've seen it. He says in verse 14, thou hast seen it. For thou beholdest mischief in spite to requite it with thy hand. He, David reminds himself. He says, you know, David says, and, and again, we're, we're catching a glimpse into his mind. And David's sitting there thinking, you know, the wicked are out there saying that, hey, God's forgotten. God doesn't see it. And then all of a sudden, he just writes down, thou hast seen it. You have. You've beheld it. You know what's going on. And so he reminds himself 
God sees every act of wickedness. He's not forgotten about it. But then he also reminds himself of the other end of that thing. Look down at chapter 10 and verse 17. And by the way, this is a wrong in your handout. I think in your handout it says 1018, but that should be 1017. It says, Lord, thou hast heard the desire of who? The humble. Thou wilt prepare their heart, thou wilt cause thine ear to hear. Go over to Psalm 9, verse 12. He says there at the end of verse 12, Psalm 9, verse 12, He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. Now look up here. Does God forget the sin of the wicked, yes or no? Come on, a little bit louder. Does He forget the sin of the wicked? No. No. It's 9.30 in the morning, but we're alive. Amen? All right. He doesn't forget the, the sin of the wicked. He hasn't overlooked it. Does he forget the cries of his children, yes or no? According to God's word, he doesn't forget either one of them. God is not stricken with senility. Isn't that great to know? Okay? Both ideas are fallacies. That that God has forgotten the cries of the humble. He's forgotten you, Christian. He doesn't know what's going on. And then, by the same token, it's a fallacy that, well, God, you know, he doesn't even care about what the wicked are doing. No matter what you are going through today... And by the way, let's bring up that next phrase in your hand out there. God, in fact, you know what it is. God will not forget the cry of who? The humble. Good. Write that in there. No matter what you're going through today, you can be assured that God always does right. Okay? He always does right. Now, Pastor Dan may not always do right. It's okay to say amen right there. Your spouse may not always do right. You better not say amen right there. But I'll tell you one thing we can all say amen on. Our kids, we know they do wrong. Amen? We know our kids do wrong. And you know what? You look around and everybody around you may do wrong, but I can just give you one assurance this morning. God always does right. He always does right. The wicked are not getting away with anything. And believers are not getting a raw deal from God. The wicked are not getting away with their sin. And nobody is a victim of God's unfairness. Nobody's being unjustly treated by God. God's not picking on you today. You need to get those thoughts out of your mind. Because as you think those thoughts, and someone may be thinking that this morning. Well, well, God's dealt me a raw deal. You know, God's just not treating me right. Well, as you, as you let those thoughts take root in your mind, it will lead to discouragement, despondency, despair. I mean, it will just send you spiraling downward. There comes a point where you have to take some responsibility for your thought life. And you have to say, no, those thoughts are not right. They are not accurate. They are not truthful. I know what God's word says. I know this book is truth. And I know that my God is on the throne judging right. David could sing praises to God even in dark days because he knew that God is on his throne judging right. I'm going to just tell you, never bring a railing accusation against God. You know, you hear people say, don't rail on me. Sometimes Teenagers used to say that a lot. You know, you, you kind of, they'd be getting picked on by other teenagers and they'd be like, quit railing on me. Well, you know what? Don't rail on God. Don't ever bring a railing accusation against God. Because God is righteous. His very nature is one of righteousness. Do you understand what that means? Uh, Let me give you an illustration. A, A dog's nature is to bark. A cat's nature is to meow. They don't have to think about it. It's just their nature to meow. A kangaroo's nature is to hop. A kangaroo doesn't sit there and say, okay, hop. No, a kangaroo's nature is to hop. A squirrel's nature is to climb a tree. A a lion's nature is to roar. The righteous Lord loveth righteousness. Righteousness is his very nature. So God instinctively does right all the time. You know, and this is something that I hear all the time. I've, I've heard this through the years. I've heard Christians, when things aren't going just the way they think they ought to be going... Many Christians really get down on God. You know, why hasn't God done this? Why hasn't he given me this? Why hasn't he done this for me? Why? And it's just, it's really 
a sad thing because we need to be filled with the faith and the, and the, uh, the belief in God's word that our God always does right. He's not giving you a raw deal. God is, th- those thoughts will do nothing but just discourage you. There comes a point where you've got to take control of your thought life and say, no, God always does right. That's the first truth I want to give you. And then the second truth is this, and that is this. God will ultimately balance the scales of justice. Now, that's at the bottom of your handout. God will ultimately balance the scales of justice. You know, some of you may think, okay, well, you say God always does right, but why am I suffering and why is my wicked uh, co-worker seem to be prospering? That's a good question, but here's the answer. God will ultimately balance the scales of justice. Now, as we look at the wickedness that's in the world today, it may seem as if God is complacent, that God is non-caring about it. I want you to look with me at Psalm 10, please. Go over to Psalm 10 and look at verse 4. David here is is thinking about some of these things, okay? And he says in verse 4, The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above, out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. Now look at verse 6. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved, the wicked, for I shall never be in adversity, the wicked say. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. Now look down at verse 11. He has said in his heart, God hath forgotten. He hideth his face. He will never see it. Verse 13. Wherefore doth the wicked contemn God? He has said in his heart, thou will not require it. So the, he says, David said, I look out here at the wicked, they're prospering. And he said, they're just kind of full of themselves. They're self-assured. They're arrogant. But you see, the great hope and the great comfort of believers is the truth that there is coming a day of reckoning. A day in which God will make everything right and he will balance the scales of justice. Let me give you an illustration of that. Let's say that Denise and I, my wife and I, go out of town for a couple days for our anniversary. And we leave Clint in charge, our 19-year-old. And, and he's old enough now, and we, we've done that. And so he's, he's 19. He's watching his 12 and 10-year-old brothers. And while we're gone, they are absolutely, I mean, out of control. And they are climbing on the furniture. They're throwing balls in the house. They are just having a big time. They won't listen to Clint. They won't obey him. They won't listen to him. And, and, and so, you know, they think, my two little boys, they think, (laughs) mom and dad aren't here. They can't see. (laughs) Well, we're not going to be punished. Mom and dad don't care. They're not here. Clint is just about to pull his hair out. You know what, though? Clint is encouraged by one fact. And that is to know there's a day of reckoning. (laughs) Right? Mom and dad will return. And when they return, they will balance the scales of justice. And so Clint takes great comfort, right, in knowing that. And that's what David's doing. In Psalm 9, David is looking forward in faith to the day when God's going to make his presence known to David's enemies. Look at Psalm 9, verse 3, where he says that. When mine enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. And then look down at verse 5. He says, Thou hast rebuked the heathen, thou hast destroyed the wicked, thou hast put out their name forever and ever. O thou enemy, destructions uh, are come to a perpetual end. And thou hast destroyed cities, notice their memorial is perished with them. David is looking forward in faith to the day when Christ and God, he will return. And he says, "My, my enemies will perish and their name and their memorial. That word memorial means their memory, their remembrance. He says it will be put out forever. And as I have taught you as we've been going through the book of Psalms, Psalms is a book really that anticipates a lot of things in prophecy. It's a prophetic book. Psalms is in a large part prophetic. And that's why Christ talked about, uh, the, he talked about how the Psalms spoke concerning him. 
The Psalms are very prophetic, many of them. They prophesy of Christ. They prophesy not only of Christ's first coming. Many of the Psalms prophesy and look forward in faith to Christ's second coming. You remember what I... Well, let me give you this statement in your handout. Psalm 9 and 10 anticipate the day when Christ will return to this earth in judgment. Now, as you read Psalm 9 and 10, remember that. David is looking forward in faith to the day. When, when Jesus Christ is going to return to the earth in judgment. Now, you remember what I taught you last week? And, and we sung about it today in the song, How Great Is Our God, The Lion and the Lamb. Remember the first time He came to the earth? He came as a lamb to give His life for sinful mankind. In your, uh, up on the screen, Romans 5, 6, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for who? The ungodly. He came and gave His life for sinners. He came and died as our substitute so that we wouldn't have to suffer the punishment that we owe for our sin. Christ is now in heaven. He's offering grace and peace to sinners on the basis of His finished work at Calvary. Up on the screen is a verse that we read last week, Romans 5.1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is up in heaven offering grace and peace to sinners if they will simply call upon Him, trust Him as their Savior. But one day, we said, He's, not, he's going to come back to the earth, not as a lamb. The Bible says He'll come back as a lion. And He's going to come and He's going to return to this earth. And He's going to establish an earthly kingdom where He will be King of kings. And the Bible says this will be a day of vengeance and retribution for the wicked who would not seek God. Look at uh, Psalm 9, verse 8. Notice how it's prophetic. It's looking forward in faith to the day. Verse 8. And he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. That's speaking of the day when Christ is King of Kings. See, look down with me at uh, Psalm uh, 917. 917. This is a verse that's taken out of context a lot. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. And, And that's a reference there to the second coming of Christ when he's sitting on the throne, the Bible says in Matthew 25, and he calls all nations before him. And the the sheep nations, the ones uh, that, that he classifies as sheep, they go into the kingdom. But the goats, the ones on his left hand that are the goats, he says they go out into hell. And that's what he's talking about. He's looking forward to that future day of judgment when he balances the scales of justice as far as individually and also for nations. Look down at verse number 19. He says, Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. Look at Psalm 10, verse 4. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. And so what about those who won't seek after God? There's coming a day in which he will balance the scales of justice. Look with me at the screen. Paul writes to the church and he says that Christ is going to come back one day to the earth in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. And and so one day Christ will return. And when He comes back, He's going to reign as King of kings. Look down at Psalm 10 and verse 6. Psalm 10 and verse number 16. I'm sorry, 16. Psalm 10, 16. Notice what David anticipates here. Again, this is prophetic. The Lord is king forever and ever. The heathen are perished out of his land. He says there's coming a day in which the heathen, the ungodly, are going to perish and he is going to be king over all the earth. But now, what about today? Well, today we know Christ is in heaven. He's not on the earth. We know that right now he's in heaven and in your handout, it says today we are not living in the day of judgment but rather we're living in the day of salvation. Every day that God withholds judgment on the earth is another day that people have the opportunity to be saved by placing their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Every day God withholds judgment is a day that people have an opportunity to be saved. That's why Paul called this the day of salvation. It's the time of salvation right now. Not the day of judgment, it's the day of salvation. So as you look around and you see the wicked prosper... And you think, well, boy, the righteous suffer. Well, Jesus said that was going to happen. Jesus said, you know, just as they've persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. 
Just as they've hated me, they'll hate you. You know, and, and, and the Apostle Paul said that Christians will suffer. They're appointed to afflictions. That's part of this time that we're living in today. You see, we're living in a time in which God's not immediately judging sin. God is withholding judgment and He's offering grace to sinners. He's giving them space and opportunity to turn to Him. But many times what happens is it can look as if, well, the righteous are suffering, the ungodly are prospering. But here's the thing. Psalm 9 and 10 anticipate the day and he encourages himself by knowing God will ultimately one day balance the scales of justice. In your handout, 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Paul said, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of judgment. Is that what it says? No. What is it now? It's the day of what? salvation. God's giving people an opportunity to be saved. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. But rest assured, it says in your handout, that the day will come when every evil deed will be punished and those who have refused God's grace will receive judgment. Paul said in Romans 2, if you'll look at the screen, he says, despiseth thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering." He said, are you going to despise God's goodness, unbeliever? He's speaking about unbelievers here who have not put their faith and trust in Christ. He said, are you going to despise the goodness of God and His, his forbearance, His long sufferingness, Not knowing that the goodness of God is leading you to repentance, to turn to Him? He said, but after thy hardness and impenitent, that means just unrepentant heart. He said, you are treasuring up, that means to store up, you, are, you, are, you may think you're getting away with it right now because it's the day of salvation. But he said you're storing, you're treasuring up unto thyself what? Wrath. When? Against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And that's what I've been telling you. Christ is going to come back to the earth as king of kings, balancing the scales of justice, and the end of that passage says... He's going to render to every man according to his deeds. And so when you're going through dark times, we can wallow in self-pity. We can do that. I've done it. We can feel sorry for ourselves. We can bring railing accusations against God. And we can just spiral down deeper and deeper. Or we can do like David, who was going through dark times. And we can say, no, no, no. God will always do right. And I know that one day he'll balance the scales of justice. And then the last truth I want to give you is this. David encouraged himself by knowing that God will never forsake his people. God will never forsake his people. This was a precious truth that David knew God was with him and would not forsake him. Look at Psalm 9 verse 10. Psalm 9 verse 10. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, hast not, what? Forsaken them that seek thee. Hey, let me explain something. You know, last week we learned from Psalm uh, 6, 7, and 8, there's evil on the earth because it's a sin-cursed earth. Sin brought with it a curse on the earth. Sin brought with it a curse on mankind. We live on a sin-cursed earth, and and here's the deal. Because we're on a sin-cursed earth, in your handout it says, God has never promised us a life without pain and trouble, but He has promised us His continued presence. I want you to look with me uh, when you write that in. Look at Psalm 9, please, verse 9. Look how David encourages himself in a dark time of his life. He says in verse 9, The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed. A refuge in times of what, church? Trouble. Hey, you, we sung that today, didn't we? I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. He's our refuge. See, in the time of trouble. We can know that God... Hey, listen. I, uh, I remember, just an illustration of this. I can remember one time we were heading to Missouri to see my mom. And we got within an hour of her house, and my youngest son, who was probably about six at the time, my youngest son was in the back seat of the van, and just all of a sudden, out of nowhere, just, I'm going to be polite, regurgitated, okay, in the van. And we're like, oh, no. And we're thinking, it's all over the place. And we're thinking, 
Hopefully, it's just a one-time thing. It's something he ate that didn't agree with him. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Every 15 to 20 minutes, he was. To the point where we were, like, I think at midnight, he was still going. I mean, like four or five hours, he'd been doing this. Every 15 to 20 minutes. Our heart broke for him. Finally, we ended up at the ER in Popper Bluff, Missouri with our son. He's got an IV in him. And, uh, oh, our heart just went out to him. And, you know, here's the thing. We could not promise him that he wouldn't regurgitate anymore. But you know what? We could promise him our continued presence, our comfort. We could assure him that we would be right there with him to help him get through it. And, and we, couldn't, we couldn't promise him, you're not going to be sick anymore. Your stomach's not going to hurt anymore. But we could promise him our continued presence. You know, the Bible teaches, and we read it earlier in your handout, it says, God hears and will not forget our cries to Him. God hears and will not forget. He says, He heareth the cry of the humble. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. He said, Lord, You've heard the desire of the humble. I think one of the most precious truths for the time of grace that we live in today is this. The very moment that we trust Christ as our Savior... The Bible says that God's Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us and we are sealed with God's Spirit until the day that Christ comes back for us. In Ephesians 4.30, it's on the screen, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, but then he says, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. That day when Christ comes to redeem you to himself. The Bible says that the great mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We are made one with Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and the Bible says nothing can separate us. We are made complete in Christ. No matter the trial that we face, the Bible says we are more than conquerors through Christ. And nothing can separate me from the love of God. And Satan will try and convince me God's forgotten you. God has forsaken you. But when the outlook is dark, we can do like David and we can sing praise to God. You say, how can we sing praise to Him? Because in your handout it says, we know that God loves us with an eternal love and He will never forsake us. Sometimes I'll hear Christians pray this and and they'll say something like this. Lord, I pray that you'll be with Brother Dan today as he preaches. Let me ask you something. Whether you pray that or not, is God going to be with me? Why? Because he lives in me. Can I go anywhere that he's not with me? If you've ever... If you've ever been going through a tough time or a trial or maybe I prayed with you, maybe maybe before surgery, you know that I never prayed. Lord, I pray that you will be with Brother Mark Kathman as he goes in for this surgery. No, I'll never pray that way. You know why? Because I know Mark knows the Lord and I know God's spirit lives within him. So guess what? Mark can't go anywhere God's not. Let that truth sink in. He can't go. If he goes in that surgery room, is God there? Yeah. He can't go anywhere God's not. Why? Because God lives in him. Now I pray, Lord, strengthen him. Lord, encourage him. Lord, I pray you'll fill him with your peace because I know you live within him. So fill him with that peace. Fill him with your comfort. Fill him with your strength. But I don't have to pray, Lord, be with him. I know God's with him. I know God's with him. God lives in him. And you don't have to pray, Lord, be with Pastor Dan. Oh, he is. (laughs) He is. Because he said, he'll never leave me and he'll never forsake me. Amen? In your handout at the bottom, it says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never, what? Leave thee, nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, (laughs) The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me.
Notice it didn't say Dr. Phil is my helper. <laughs> Oprah is my helper. No, no. It said, who's my helper? The Lord. Can I invite you to look at the screen and let this verse encourage you, and this will be the last thing we'll look at. And let's say it together. Let's just say this verse together and let it sink in. Let this truth about God's continued presence in your life sink into you. I don't care what happened. You said, my husband walked out on me. God's with you. I messed up over the weekend. And I sinned and I did wrong. God's with you. He's with you. He didn't leave you. Pastor Dan, I found out from the doctor I've got terminal cancer. If you know the Lord is your Savior, He's with you. He's with you. And this verse says in Psalm 118.6, say it with me, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me?